Um, I will start with uh, Scott Z. Burns, the director of the report and also writer of The Laundromat. Um, and uh, Jamshid Akkerby, a professor at William Patterson University. Uh, and Devika Girish, uh, assist assistant editor at Film Comment. So the, basically the premise for this panel uh, is, uh, broadly speaking, politics and cinema, but specifically what I was interested in talking about are the challenges of telling real world stories, uh, not in a vague sense, but the actual like narrative. How do you tell a really complex story? Because sometimes the most important ones and the most urgent ones are the hardest to get across and communicate in a meaningful way. Um, and there are all sorts of obstacles that can get in the way. Um, so, I mean, I thought we could talk, start by talking about uh, the report, uh, which comes out in uh, November. Um, and it's a film that follows the, I guess, the, the journey <laughs> of the torture report, the long and torturous journey of the torture report, um, and specifically a, a kind of unsung or lesser known hero compared to some bigger names in, in history, uh, Daniel Jones. Uh, and the five years in the making and what's a combination of political and bureaucratic and investigative uh, and legal struggle to bring facts to light that we all needed to know uh, about what the CIA was uh, doing uh, in our name. So I guess to start off, um, Scott, I wonder if you could talk about you know, how you approach telling that kind of story uh, in the sense that there are many layers to it. Uh, there is you know, the actual progress of putting together and researching such a report. There are, you, know, you include flashbacks uh, in the structure to show some of what the report chronicles, which is pretty rough stuff as well, uh, and balancing all that with the political calculus uh, as well. So I wonder if you could, you could talk a bit about that. Um, I, I can try. <laughs> uh, first of all, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm honored to be included here. Uh, you know, it's interesting. You know, I, I became aware of what's called the CIA's EIT program um, probably around the same time as a lot of you. And I, I, you know, my, my first real awareness was from a small Vanity Fair piece um, about the two psychologists uh, who had sold the program to the CIA after 9-11 as a way of getting information from detainees. Um, and they explained to the CIA that they had come up with what was called the special sauce that could get people to talk um, because there was a belief that Al-Qaeda had somehow come up with some magic way of of avoiding conventional, you know, what, what people in law enforcement will tell you is rapport building based um, interrogation. So I started with that and around the, the time that I began the project, the, the Senate Intelligence Committee report on the program came out. And it's, if you go online, which you still can, you can find it. Um, it's being republished by Melville Publishing. You can order it if you want. Um, it's pretty redacted and it's really difficult reading. I mean, you, you realize, and, it, and it's, it's basically comprised of Daniel Jones and the Intelligence Committee's research, but it's all pulled from CIA emails, CIA real-time correspondence, um, and it, it, you know, it's brutal. And, and, you know, if you grew up the way I did, it's, it's not what you wanted to believe that you know, America would do, um, and so you can you can maybe decide I'm very naive, um, but that was stunning to me. Um, so I wanted to tell the story of a guy telling a story, basically, and and that's that's sort of where I got into it. And there are two sort of aspects to the movie. One is the work that Dan did, um, and so it's a guy doing an investigation. Um, and sometimes that requires a flashback. You know, a few years ago, I wrote a movie called The Bourne Ultimatum, and in that, we use a fair amount of flashbacks just because as M Matt Damon's being chased forward, he's also trying to figure out what happened to him in the past, and 
you know, film has a, a language that allows you to do that. It has sort of a past tense, um, although it's, it's a scary place as a writer to go. Um, so I employed that for part of it to help get, you know, help the audience learn what Dan was learning in the same moment. And then, you know, the second half of the movie deals with what Dan had to do to get his report out into the world. And, and in terms of, you know, selecting, you know, obviously it's, it's a long process. How do, you, what, how do you select what to prioritize about communicating in, in that process and, and even, you know, how much detail to go into? Because you also, you know, I mean, I, I think of another movie that talked about Abu Ghraib, Ghraib I think, uh, Standard Operating Procedure, um, which took a kind of, you know, the, the Errol Morris documentary, which had these, like, kind of expressionistic touches of, like, dogs lunging, you know, to, to kind of get you somehow in the mindset of the horrific stuff that's going on. Um, but the, the model for, a model for the report is, is more kind of an investigative thriller. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, because I was making a scripted piece, there were, there is, you know, there is a grammar for those things. And going back to movies like All the President's Men, and I felt there was a real connection with the sort of paranoid thrillers that Alan Pakula made um, in the early 70s that I wanted to lean into. So, you know, I would have my crew over for dinner and we would have pizza and we would watch, you know, all the President's Men, and we watched Sidney Lumet movies, and we would watch Serpico, and other movies that, to me, were about people who struggled to tell the truth against, uh, against big odds. In terms of choosing things, you know, it, it, it sort of becomes, for me, I, did, I had written a play before I wrote this movie, and I, I never really had, re had appreciated the value of a table read. Um, until I had done that, because you don't do that on movies until sometimes after the fact. They do that in TV a little bit, and they do that in the theater, and it's an incredible opportunity for a writer to really get a, an understanding, especially in our piece, because it's a lot of people talking to each other. Mm -hmm. And that, that helped me kind of track what things really land and what things were redundant. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I had the advantage of having Adam Driver and Annette Benning and Corey Stoll and an incredible cast to help me you know, tell the story. Yeah, uh, it's interesting you're mentioning um, the, the Alan Pakula movies from the 70s because it seems there sometimes are points in like American history and American movies where the climate, it's, there's a feeling that the fever needs a break somehow, and these movies need to be made. And you know, maybe that happened in the 70s, that happened in the 70s definitely, sort of happening you know, since, I don't know, September 11th to a certain extent in American cinema. Um, and, but there's always a bit of a limit to, to maybe how much, how explicit you can be, how much you can talk about things, and a caution. Um, so this is my kind of roundabout segue to coming to Iranian cinema a bit, uh, which has its own uh, political climate uh, to deal with uh, in terms of um, just depicting even daily life and, and what kind of strictures are on that. Um, I wonder if, if we could hear a bit about, uh, you know, what, what sort of limitations, because um, Jamshid, you did a documentary about talking with Iranian filmmakers, um, and it's, you know, they had different views of the, the idea of censorship, or whether that's even, uh, uh, you know, you can even talk about it in those terms, um, and what those factors are. And just, you know, for example, for Jafar Banahi, you know, what is the process for him in terms of trying to get a movie made much less, you know, out of the country. Uh, thank you very much, Nick, and uh, glad to be here. Thank you all for uh, coming here. Uh, can I just interject one oh, point please, about yeah. what Scott was talking about? You know, you, from, I haven't seen the report yet, but from uh, your description, it reminds me of very much of a movie that I saw recently, uh, Gavin Hood's Official Secrets, a British movie. I don't right. know if you've mm -hmm. seen it. Yeah. It's about the story of a whistleblower and going through the same crisis of conscience that you mentioned that your character goes through. And the reason I mentioned that, you know, I thought it was an excellent movie and completely got lost. I mean, it didn't get any notices anywhere. But again, this is a British movie 
by the same director who gave you Eye in the Sky a few years ago. Oh, the, right, yeah, the yeah, drones yeah. killing, yeah. 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 And thank you for bringing up, you know, movies like All the Presidents, man. You go back to the 60s and, you know, we had movies like Seven Days in May, we have The Next Man, we have Manchurian Candidate, obviously. And the reason I'm mentioning these films are, you know, how much we need them <laughs> right now. Mm. <laughs> it's really, you know, the, so, I don't know, the movies of social commitment, basically, mm. to sort of do something about the situation or make us think about the situation. Iranian cinema, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, you know, when you contact me and you said the title of this panel is The State of the Nation, the first thing that came to my mind was what nation? Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I left it kind of open. <laughs> about Iranian yeah. cinema. I'm supposed yeah. to be an expert on Iranian yeah. cinema. <laughs> so that's why I went, to, uh, went there. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not easy making movies in Iran, and that's mainly because of uh, the censorship. You know, Iran has never been a democratic country, unfortunately. Uh, some 40 years ago, when there was a different regime, uh, uh, the Shah's regime, uh, there was a censorship in uh, full force, but it was the kind of censorship that you expect from an authoritarian regime. Basically, uh, you know, political censorship, the sensitivities that the regime had towards, you know, being criticized, basically, the government being criticized, or uh, the royals being criticized, even the army, the police, you couldn't, you couldn't do that, you know, uh, a movie like Dirty Harry, you really couldn't show that because it wasn't glorifying the role of the police as it's supposed to be if you're making a movie about them. But then, so that was tolerable, you know, because Iran was not the only country under that kind of uh, censorship. But unfortunately, with the Islamic Revolution and what happened to cinema afterwards, they kept all those censorship codes, the political ones, and they added new ones that had to do with Islam and, and the religion in, in general. So as a result of that, right now, you can't have the slightest contact between members of the uh, opposite sexes. You know, even a mother and son, playing mother and son in a movie can't uh, touch hands. Uh, a father couldn't hug his daughter, for example. There's that restriction, and then uh, women's movies should be covered all the time. It's a question of hijab. So we can imagine the kind of restriction that it causes. Maybe if you have exterior scenes, you're okay. But we, when you go interior, you can't show a woman with covered hair having dinner with the very intimate members of uh, her family. That's a fabrication. That never happens in the r Iranian real life. Mm -hmm. So I think any movies that have been uh, made in Iran after the revolution for the past 40 years, they should come with an asterisk that don't believe what you see. <laughs> uh, but then you had uh, the filmmakers uh, who tried, there are some filmmakers such as Kiarostami or Panahi that you mentioned, mm -hmm. they try to go with the stories that doesn't require the presence of men and women under a ceiling. Can you imagine that kind of restriction in your work? Uh, that's why, for example, Panahi has a reputation for making street movies, like movies that take place on the street, and that wasn't his choice. Uh, and then uh, there were a number of subjects that they couldn't even touch, you know, having to do with uh, the sanctity of religion, for example. You can't question that. You still can't question the political regime. So, uh, I mean, in this country, sometimes people talk about censorship and I don't know what they're talking about because <laughs> the kind of censorship that, that really exists in Iran right. is something that you know belongs to film history in terms of having had nothing like it. It really belongs to a sort of infamous chapter of uh, film history. Yeah, well, but it's it's interesting to think when when there might be kind of an unspoken, uh, not not censorship, but an unspoken you know restriction against things. I mean, I'm, for example, like with the report, I'm curious if you ever had any material in it where someone was like, ah, oh, this is not really gonna fly. I mean, either because it was, you know, not like classified, but just something that maybe the audience wouldn't be ready to absorb in some way, you know, I don't know. Which kind of amounts to a kind of limit on what you could show. Well, first of all, how, have, has anybody here seen the report yet? Oh, great. Um, so, <laughs> that's fun for me. Um, <laughs> 
Well, I hope all of you will. Um, you know, uh, the report itself, um, and I should have brought a copy, um, you know, was 7,000 pages long, and it was, you know, Dan Jones, uh, you know, found himself caught between the desire of the Senate Intelligence Committee to get this report out and the, you know, the desire of the CIA to suppress the report. Um, and the story sort of spans both the Bush and the Obama administration. Um, and I'm, I don't wanna give away too much about the roles of all of those people, but you're gonna find some of it surprising, um, or at least I did. You know, the report is heavily redacted and 500 pages came out and I spent a lot of time during my research talking to Dan and our arrangement at the beginning was, you know, don't, don't tell me anything I can't know, <laughs> um, no matter how close we get. And Dan is an incredibly, you know, careful, thoughtful guy and he understood that that was not only protecting him, that was protecting me as well. And so there were limits in terms of what I could learn about the program. Dan has assured me that the summary is a good stand-in for the 6,700 pages. Um, you know, I think eventually the report will be unredacted. Mm -hmm. But as you said at the beginning, and I think one of the issues we all face, and it was true of the movies after the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. is you know, the first half of history is usually, or first draft of history is usually wrong. Right. And you know, there's a great book that I read while I was doing my research um, called Human Smoke by Nicholson Baker mm -hmm. about World War II. And if you go and read this book, you realize you don't know shit about World War II <laughs> because what I was taught in school <laughs> and what's in that book, um, you know, it's, you realize, wow, this whole history is told by the victors thing is a, is a problem. Um, and so I think one of the roles of cinema is to be patient and to wait. And I think that's really important in the moment we're in because getting it wrong right now with the internet and with mm -hmm. you know the way that someone can propagate a false narrative, it has to be a cautionary tale to storytellers regardless of their medium. Yeah, sure. Um, I, um, I wanted to switch gears just, just a little um, to look at this, the question of getting politically uh, sensitive or politically provocative material into cinema and look at it from a different angle. Um, uh, uh, Devika wrote an, an article, um, this is probably gonna be a surprise and I'm bringing this movie up in this context, but you'll see, um, about Black Panther. Um, which is, uh, you know, on the face of it, you know, a, a, in some ways, say, a conventional, you know, superhero blockbuster, um, but actually is a film that kind of broaches some pretty interesting political ideas and, and reframing of, of how we look at the world um, and also how aesthetics can communicate certain things about, about power structures. Um, even within a movie that, that, you know, looks like it's mostly about, you know, good and evil or not. Um, but, uh, Devik, I wonder if you could talk a bit about, about that article and, and how that, that all works. Sure. Um, I think that article was um, sort of an interesting challenge, but also the kind of criticism I really love, which is, you know, sometimes looking at these kind of mass objects in cinema or just in media in general can produce some of the best political analyses um, just because, I don't know, I, I like to think of sort of mass culture or popular cinema as like the unconscious of, of the people in some ways and really capturing, um, you know, what people want to see and how they want to see themselves reflected, but also the images that reinforce what we already um, know. And so I, I approached that movie from that angle and sort of thinking both about what, um, what it reinforces but also what it reframes and sort of what untapped in, in, in sort of, you know, it, it's the first Marvel movie with, this, with an all black cast and that's set in a fictional African country based on real countries and a, the real anti-colonial pan-Africanist struggle. 
So in the ways, but it's also a consumer object that is in some ways aimed at tapping into a, you know, what I think studios think of as an untapped market. Um, and so thinking of all of those factors together, I think what you just said about, you know, thinking of how aesthetics e express certain political ideas, and that's a question that comes up a lot, and I'm sure both of you have answered these questions about, um, you know, how do we reconcile the two, or, you know, as critics, I think something we have to reckon with a lot is people accusing us of favoring one or the other, or, or saying, uh, maybe, you know, why do you always have to talk about the politics of the film is something I get a lot, and like, you know, well, there's no more space for formal analyses of films, and I mean, it, it's tried to say this at this point, but I just don't see the two as separate in any way. They're so closely interlinked. Um, Jamshid wrote a really good piece for Film Comment a couple years ago in which he talked to Jafar Panahi about making films under censorship. And if you read that, you'll see such minor formal decisions are also affected by the political conditions of filmmaking. So uh, the use of more interior scenes in some of his films is because he's filming under you know, great duress and great stress about being caught. Um, and also the, but on the other hand, the use of exterior scenes is a response to not wanting to have the unrealistic image of a woman wearing a hijab indoors. And this is an extreme example, but there's so many, you know, more sort of what you might consider frivolous examples. Like in Indian cinema, much of the grammar of romance has emerged, you know, from the inability to show kissing scenes, not even due to any particular censorship, but just, you know, social sort of a taboo about seeing sexual, sexually explicit scenes on film. So the idea, you know, is that as long as film has existed, formal decisions have been dictated by bureaucratic, logistical, and political conditions. And that's something I was really interested in when thinking about that film and the way in which um, that film really, Black Panther was reframing also the language of science fiction, mm -hmm. um, a genre that has always been very political, always been sort of reflecting on the conditions of our times and the mass fears of our time and how that film was sort of rewriting that vocabulary by bringing in Afrofuturism uh, and a different form of science fiction that uh, we often don't see in the West, which combines like spiritualism with techno-futurism. And that was sort of my angle. But sort of closing the loop and coming back to some things where we were talking about, something I didn't fully address in that article, I gestured towards, and something I've been thinking about is also, you know, that film features a benevolent CIA, you know, <laughs> operative who is helping this pan-African, you know, anti-colonialist country and its leaders, which is really an insult to the history of the <laughs> pan-Africanist anti-colonialist movement and the ways in which the CIA has, you know, what the role it has played in sabotaging these movements, in the literal murder of many of the leaders on whom you know, from whom the movie purportedly takes inspiration. So really, there's so many different threads to sort of keep in place, and especially today, I think, um, where I think I obviously have a personal stake in diversity, and I'm interested in diversity being represented in the making of films, in, the, uh, in actual film form, in, I'm interested in representation. But I'm also a little bit suspicious when diversity becomes a marketing tool and doesn't sort of account for these structural industrial realities of filmmaking that may not support, you know, what is on screen or what the studio wants you to see. And another Marvel movie that comes to mind is um, Captain Marvel, which, you know, is touted as this like piece of feminist, this feminist epic, but it was made closely in collaboration with the US military. It's a really militarist film. The military promoted it. The CIA actually tweeted about Black Panther extensively. Oh, man. And, you know, and so there's, uh, I'm, that's something I always grapple with is, you know, thinking about all these different layers in which politics permeate cinema and how do you keep them separate, but also how do you keep them together? How do you think through all of them and, mm. and sort of arrive at, at what you know? What makes progressive cinema, or what is reactionary, or what is, um, yeah, just just thinking about how is how the political is embodied. There's various ways to look at it. Yeah. 
I, I, I thought Black Panther was good and now it's bad. <laughs> See, that's it's the thing. Uh, <laughs> Things can be good and bad, and that's what makes everything so hard. It's true. It's so hard. Why does it have to be so hard? Um, yeah, I have, I have like two million things to oh, say. Oh, please. Yeah. To what you just said. Um, well, one of the things that I think does happen in this country that we don't talk about, um, you know, and when you ask me about, you know, sort of, I mean, there are people who have seen the report who are like, how, how did this, you know, how did this government allow you to make this movie, and how long do you expect to live? Um, <laughs> and, you, you know, the thing that's interesting is I developed this movie at HBO, um, who I believe is one of your sponsors here for this event. For the talks, yes. Um, Be careful what you say. I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> I said joking. this in front of them. Um, <laughs> and, you know, one of the things that I, I, you know, that happened was we started there, they budgeted the movie, you know, they were gonna give me something like 43 days and $18 million, which was, you know, amazing to me that I would get that much money and that much time to go and tell this story. And then suddenly I got a phone call saying, this is a hot potato and we're not sure we can make it right now. And I said, does this have anything to do with the current administration and your, you know, your desire to have a merger with AT&T that's being contested? And no one would answer my question. Um, and I don't know if that's true, although if you ask Jane Mayer, who is a really wonderful journalist, she would probably silently nod and laugh because she told me they won't make your movie. Um, <laughs> and I don't know if that's true. Um, I really don't. Um, but for me, as a filmmaker, you know, I was sent off into the wilds and I ended up making my movie at, at Vice for, you know, $8 million in 26 days. Um, and, you know, and so some of these things that you talk about become, you know, have an influence on you because before they won't let you make your movie, they will let you make it poorly. Um, <laughs> And, and that is something that happens in capitalism. Um, so I do think that it's, when you're living it on the ground. Poorly, uh, as in, is that a qualitative statement or, or, or monetary? A budgetary. <laughs> monetary. Okay. <laughs> um, no, I, they'll, they'll challenge you. And look, I, you know, I, I teach at Sundance every year and I, there are people there who make their movies for three, four million dollars in, you know, in 12 days. Um, and so the great thing is there's technology that's making it easier. Um, but yeah, I mean, in a system like ours, there are sort of considerations of marketing and you know, that, that have an influence that I think is probably very much what you're describing as, you know, as influences that might be based on, on religion or, you know, or politics. I mean, the movie that I tried to make with the report really is much less political than probably most of you and the four people who have seen it back me up here um, <laughs> um, than you might think. I mean, it, and it is relevant to this moment. I mean, you know, yesterday I was asked about it in context of what's happening right now in our country. And to me, this, you know, if you're an elected member of our Congress right now, this isn't a, a, a political choice. It's your obligation, it's a constitutional obligation. It isn't about being a Democrat or a Republican at all, and neither is the issue surrounding torture. It's about what you know, we are constitutionally obligated to do, and people who are elected to Congress right now, if they believe there was a crime, and I don't know if there was or wasn't, but they're obligated to investigate. That's why we have, you know, oversight and accountability in this country. And that's really what the report is about, is about accountability, not about, you know, Dems being right and ours being wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's what the product. Here, here. I think that what Scott was referring to, uh, and for you to have to make your film poorly, is what's happening to the American cinema, and that's the Disneyfication of American cinema. I take that back. I would say Disneyfication of Hollywood. Mm -hmm. you know, we all know that you know, 
Disney is so dominant in the market right now. They have, did you know they have 36% of the market share? That's huge. It's enormous. Right? That's unbelievable. And the problem is they're setting an example. The other major studios are looking at them and they want to follow their recipe because that's what the capitalist system, they want to make more money. They make money you, you make, the more successful and more respectable you are. And that's how Disney ends up with that kind of huge, uh, the lion share of the market or, you know, the lion king share of the market <laughs> in this case. That's right. But, you know, and it's not just there. It's not just there, it's setting an example, not only in this country or you know how the movies are supposed to be defined, which makes my job as a film professor really difficult because I'm working with the students whose perception of movies would be the Disney movies because those are the movies that are being played in uh, multiplexes. So I have to really explain sometimes the formal elements, for example, it's something completely alien to them. I was playing this great movie to the class a couple of days ago, uh, A World Apart, Chris Menges, which is a great movie about apartheid, 1988. And this is a class about film and civic engagement. So it's about activism. We're hoping we're showing these movies to the students and that would inspire them to also become activists within their own communities and care about you know, becoming socially engaged. So the criticism they had was why the movie was so dark. <laughs> you know, the director of that movie, not dark in terms of the subject matter, I'm sorry, dark in terms of not having sufficient lighting. And now we're talking about the director, Chris Menges, who's a DP. I mean, that's his day job. That was actually the very first movie he made as a director. So I had to explain to them that, guys, the dominant style of lighting in this movie is what we call backlighting. So you use backlighting and then that makes everybody look dark, you know, silhouette-like. And why? This movie is about apartheid. This movie is about racial discrimination. The director has chosen to show everybody in this movie, including the main character, which is a white family, basically, headed by Barbara Hershey as a South African uh, journalist. So there are scenes when you see everybody in a dark face. So that's an important, you know, formal touch. And the, the interpretation of the part of the students who've grown up watching Disney movies or the kind of, those kinds of Disney movies is, I said, it's too dark, we don't want to look at this, they did <laughs> amateurish movie. Right, yeah. I sort of have a question. Um, you know, you're talking about teaching a class about cinema and civic engagement. And so you have the opportunity to show these films and then talk about their formal elements and sort of break things down. And you're, that bridge between the movie and civic engagement, you're sort of performing that. Um, and I guess something I wonder sometimes about, you know, political cinema is, you know, can cinema be like inherently political or do we have to make it political? And I think critics, we sometimes try to do that work of, of mm -hmm. you know, bringing films to people, to finding, giving them ways to enter films. But um, sometimes the most political, radical cinema is cinema that doesn't really get seen by most people or the people who need to see it. And cinema that can reach most people sometimes has to be, I guess, made accessible or, or you know, has to take routes that might not be the most radical. And I'm, wor you know, I'm just curious, um, maybe Scott, you can speak to this as well, about how, what you perceive as the impact of your film, whether you think about what, how audiences will react to it and how much, how you try to, I guess, build that into the film. Um, well, I've been, I've been thinking a lot about this <laughs> lately because um, people keep asking me. I mean, <laughs> I guess, as a storyteller, and you know, this really is true, I, I do feel like stories choose me much more than I choose them. Um, and I am a person alive in the same culture that you guys are, and I you know, watch the news and read the newspaper, and 
And so, you know, when something inspires me, I want to tell the story. And for me, in the case of the report, both my parents are psychologists. And when I learned that psychologists had authored this program, that was very provocative to me on a very personal level. Um, you know, when I did Contagion with Steven Soderbergh, I was very upset that science has given us these amazing tools to help protect um, our children and each other. And I would go and talk to people about what public health means. And, you know, the, the great teachers and the great thing about my job, whether it was on contagion or on an inconvenient truth, um, was I got to learn. And public health isn't just about protecting yourself, it's about protecting your neighbor. And you, you don't go out when you're sick because you, you don't want to get people, other people sick. And, you know, I've spent time having, you know, being beaten up by very wealthy people <laughs> um, who believe that, you know, who are anti-vax. And they're convinced that, you know, based on science by Andrew Wakefield, which has been disproven repeatedly, that vaccines are bad. Um, and so I guess when I hear stories like that, I, I'm not conscious of I'm going to write a political movie. It's just I want to tell, I want to tell that story because um, it's dramatic to me and it's inspiring to me and it's scary. And you know, like, I mean, I think Orwell said that you know art is political, and the point of view that it shouldn't be is something that's also very, very political. Mm -hmm. And Toni Morrison said the same thing 50 years later. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when I look at my fellow filmmakers, you know, I think the decision not to tell important stories about the moment you're in is also indicative of the pressures that a storyteller feels. And I hope, you know, I hope that more, more people will, you know, we have kids in cages right now. Like, someone needs to tell that story. Right. Uh, and I really think it's uh, the viewer that decides whether a movie is political or not, de depending on how he or she is influenced by the movie. When, again, going back to the discussion I had with my class the other day, you, you don't say just because the movie is about apartheid, it makes it a political movie. What really made it political, and I had to discuss this with my class, that apartheid was a black issue but that movie has a white family as the main characters of the movie. You do see black families, but they're all in the background. They're getting tortured and killed, yet they're in the background. It's the reaction of the white family to what happens in the background. And my question to the class was, how come we don't see the black families in the foreground if this movie is about their suffering? And then, you know, there was back and forth. We decided that that's the politics of the box office. Because if you had a black family in the foreground, not as many people would go to see the movie. And again, yet these people, Chris Mangus, who makes the movie, he's obviously has a noble pur purpose. But then it runs into the same problem that you run into with HBO. I mean, the restriction, you say, I want a so black we'll family, they there. say. <laughs> 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 they would say, no, we're not going to make money that way. So again, that's the kind of interpretation that all of a sudden turns the whole thing into something political. Yeah, I mean, that's, well, that's where Black Panther is an interesting example as well, because to a certain extent, that's, that's a belief or you know, an assumed conventional wisdom that Hollywood has that, that the film with you know, a black protagonist or a black family would not sell as well. But Black Panther just kind of put, put the lie to that and showed that that was just a false. So basically, this industrial wisdom that people had was actually just a political belief, you know, like, you know. But, I mean, Black Panther also had Marvel and a giant well, sure. marketing yeah. budget. To me, the, the story that, you know, is amazing and much more gratifying is Get Out. Oh, well, yeah. sure, yeah, And yeah. so, like, when I saw that movie, I got up and, ch like, that's the most I think I've ever learned about my society in a movie theater. You know, probably since One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. No, that's, that's a monumental film, yeah, for sure. Um, we well, had a number of movies like that last year. Uh, Spike Lee's movie. Oh, yeah, Black Klansman. Uh, yeah. Sorry uh, to bother you. you know, they're all the same type of movies. And I think what's, you know, Get Out 
and also... I'm just pulling that. We had it on the cover. So. <laughs> An illustration. Um, Sorry. What's interesting also about, you know, I think Get Out is so effective is because it dares to really, you know, make white people villains. I mean, it really dares to, like, show white people at their banal worst. Um, and I guess that's sort of the quandary that I struggle with with Black Panther and, mm. you know, and it, it maybe is a movie that disproves this sort of um, industrial wisdom, but you know, it would be really radical if Marvel made a movie about the actual Black Panthers and, and they were, you know, actually superheroes and did, did everything they did or, or something like that. I think you have and a pitch right there, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what are any, you doing? Any producers here? Uh, um, yeah, and, and that's, that's sort of, a, you know, the, I think the, the quandary is, is how to really get things that get to the root of what really makes us deeply uncomfortable about ourselves onto these sort of mass screens. And I think that's sort of, for me, like a big challenge when it comes to thinking about political cinema. Yeah, no, definitely. And not to help you sell magazines, but <laughs> if you haven't seen Parasite, oh, um, yes. that to me is such an astonishingly brilliant political movie um, because, I mean, and I know director Bong a little bit, and, you know, it's, have you, has anyone seen that yet? It's, it's coming up in the festival, so. Um, it's think. really amazing, and it's, you know, it's just a great way of Trojan horsing mm -hmm. um, a couple of genres yeah. to, to, to tell a story, and you leave there, and what I think he did, does that is so extraordinary is you're so entertained and it's such a good movie and you go away and you think about it and you realize he said so much about society um, without making you feel like you were eating your vegetables. And to me, that's, <laughs> you know, that's the best that scripted you know, film can do. Yeah, definitely. Um, we're, we're going to be getting to the final part of this talk. Uh, so in these last few minutes, I just wanted to make sure we got a question or two from the audience. So does anyone have a question um, right here in the middle? If you could just wait for the mic, please, so we can hear you. Since uh, probably the mid to late 90s, the CIA has had an office in Hollywood. Um, and I was wondering if you could uh, kind of talk about maybe how that's influenced um, how, I mean, I, mean the, I think the purpose of that office has been to, uh, to um, for them to portray, or to give resources to filmmakers who want to portray the way the CIA uh, kind of meets their vision in, in a certain way. Um, so maybe you could talk a little bit about the, um, kind of the ethics of doing that and, and how you see that uh, that's affected the portrayal of the agency in the work of uh, filmmakers like Mark Bowl and, uh, and other filmmakers. I just I've want to quickly interject. A movie that CIA had a little bit of a hand in that you might not know is Meet the Parents. They actually um, apparently suggested a change in the movie because there's a scene where um, Ben Stiller finds like finds out that uh, Robert De Niro is an agent and the scene in which he finds out um, Robert De Niro, he finds Robert De Niro's pictures with dignitaries on his desk, that originally he found torture manuals and that was changed to just photos and um, wow. on the suggestion of the CIA. Something I found out recently and I was like, wow. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I guess you want me to answer that. Um, <laughs> shit. Um, look, I've never been contacted by them. That's probably a big shock to everybody here. Um, you know, uh, they're not the only people who have that. I mean, the FBI has, has one, and you know, I think that if we think that we live in a society that, you know, that doesn't realize the power of popular culture and film and TV, then, you know, buyer beware. I mean, you know, propaganda is something that has a lot of different bases. Um, 
you know, I, I don't know Mark's research process. I think he's an incredibly talented guy. Um, you know, I know that he's a journalist and, and that I believe, and I really do believe this, um, that Mark is smart enough and conscious enough as a person that anything he's told, he, he goes back and looks at different sources. So I don't, I, you know, I don't believe that Mark is, you know, in the pocket of the CIA at all. I think it's incumbent on all of us when you're a writer and you're telling a story to not stop when you heard the story that you want. You, you gotta go and talk to the person, the other, the other side, as much as you can. Um, but it's tricky, you know, when we were doing An Inconvenient Truth, I remember someone coming up to me and saying, well, you didn't talk to anybody from the other side. And I said, well, tell me what the other side is. <laughs> and they're like, well, you know, it's, you know, the side that says it's a hoax. And I said, but there's 99 point something scientists who say this is really happening. And this is a problem that I think we have throughout the media. I don't understand why on some of these things, like, you know, we think that it's fair to have some, you know, people, like when did that, well I know when it happened, it happened during the Reagan administration, but like that's terrifying to me that, you know, 15 years after making that film, I still end up having conversations about whether climate science is real. Um, and it's infuriating and, and there are, you know, so I'm less worried about the CIA than I am about the oil companies and the fossil fuel industry that wants to keep that debate alive and we have to sit here and have a, like a little kid explain to us, you know, how we're not doing anything. That to me is, is humiliating. Another question uh, there. Mm -hmm. Could you elucidate what you meant about allowing um, a film to be made but poorly um, in the sense that uh, is, is that sort of, am I going too far to, to say that you have accepted uh, an audience at large which mistakes uh, production value and money on the screen with, with truth and quality? Um, boy, do I regret saying that. So first <laughs> let me just say that. I was trying to be funny and that didn't work. Um, yeah, what I was trying to say is that, you know, the system that exists, you know, is favors comic book movies. I mean, go and look at what's playing. And it's hard enough to get people to go out and see a movie. And, you know, I know I want people to go to movies, but I also recognize that one of the good things about, you know, a, a, a company like Netflix is a movie that I wrote, you know, that Steven Soderbergh directed called The Laundromat came out last night and that would have never happened, like that's never happening. But because Merrill read the script and liked it and Gary Oldman and Anto they, you know, Netflix, stepped up and I, I don't think it was about the message, I think it was about the algorithm and that, you know, and so, and s you know, so I guess what I'm saying about what happened in my experience is that you find yourself going to get, I mean, the first thing you do is you need to go and figure out what the foreign is on your movie, right? Like you seem to understand this business. And I had Annette Benning and Adam Driver. I had two pretty big stars. I thought my movie would be worth quite a bit of money for him. And, you know, what I was told by foreign sales agents is that nobody cares about an American political thriller. And so my movie was assigned a value of four. And the multiplier was if it's four internationally and four domestically, I had to figure out a way to make the movie for eight. And I was like, I, I just don't believe that there isn't a foreign appetite for a film like this with Annette Benning and Adam Driver. And it was really gratifying when we, and I know that, you know, Canada is not a million miles from the United States, but, you know, Canadians are their own culture. And showing them the movie and, you know, getting, uh, you know, having it get a standing ovation was super gratifying because I was like, oh, these stories do resonate elsewhere. Um, is it 
more like, you know, a thistle that sticks to a bear's ass that, you know, travels. Well, <laughs> I think that there are, there's, you know, what people in Hollywood call IP, um, and, you know, and, and so, you know, if it's a Star Wars movie or a Marvel movie and there's a comic book out there or it's, it's, it's a thing that we all know about, then there tends to be greater willingness to invest when it's a political thriller that might involve, you know, a little scary picture of torture, um, you know, that's a harder sell. And, you know, that's, that's the way it is, you know? I mean, so, uh, you know, all I was trying to say is that the market pressures on a filmmaker, you know, if you really stick to it and don't walk away because, you know, your budget went from 18 to eight, you now have to figure out eight. And so some of the grammar that you guys are talking about, and it's always been the case, is dictated by the fact that it's eight. And so I wasn't gonna be able to do technocranes, and I wasn't gonna get a helicopter, and I wasn't gonna do a lot of things that other people get to do. I wasn't gonna you know, always have the opportunity to do coverage of every, so all of these decisions that are inherently artistic are also dictated by the economics of getting through your day. You know, when you're shooting six or seven pages a day, that's a lot different set of decisions for a director to make than two. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you can. <coughs> building on these questions. As a filmmaker, then, you know, you, you, talk, you talked about allowing history to be uh, wrong on the first take. Um, are, you, are you making stuff for posterity? I mean, when you make films these days, are you hoping your grandchildren are going to be <coughs> picking up clothes from, from what you do? Or, I mean, how do you see that? I guess I just feel as a storyteller that I want to be very, very careful and that there's a lot of incentive to be first and to go fast. Um, and we love things that are topical and rapid. You know, but for me, the fact that the largest Senate study ever done you know, came out felt like permission for me to do the report. I wouldn't have done it without that. Um, for me, the fact that there are hundreds of years of, of, you know, epidemiology to inform how I was going to do contagion tells me that that's what I can do. You know, something that's newer is scarier to me because I, my process requires me to do a huge amount of research. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, anyone on? I definitely have a question if you don't. Anyone have one? Okay, here in the front row. Yeah. Uh, if you could just wait for the mic, please. Thanks. So, speaking of foreign, uh, I've read a little bit about the effect of uh, Chinese financed films and the emergence of the Chinese box office. Have you found that to affect the movies that are being made and uh, what you're allowed to do? I haven't had that experience, you know, the laundromat was something that I wrote basically on spec outside of the studio system because I didn't think anybody was going to make a movie about the Panama Papers. Um, and so that was something that Steven and I worked on independently and then took it to Netflix, you know, the report. So I, I haven't, I don't, I haven't had that experience. I can't really comment. Uh, <coughs> China is becoming the largest uh, film market in the world. Right now they have more screens than we have in this country, obviously because of their much larger population, 1.3 billion. But also what's interesting is the way they are also influenced by American movies. The top box office movie in China is a Chinese movie called uh, Wolf Warrior. And we'll, when you look at the movie, you think you're watching Rambo. I mean, except that, you know, there are different characters. He, he's doing this main character, the same exact things that Rambo did in a number of movies. And Wolf Warriors also a number of movies, serialized movies. So that's what I was talking about, the, really the perils of Hollywood as, uh, as in uh, s cultural superpower, so to speak, uh, and a tastemaker, not only in this country, 
but for uh, the rest of the world. And again, the more we see that the kind of disnification we're talking about and the kind of pressure that they're putting on making movies like The Report, you know, that situation not only going to get worse here in this country, but in the rest of the world. Although, you know, we, we're very helpful, hopeful that movies like The Report can still be made or The Laundromat, we have Netflix that they can make it, but that doesn't necessarily help these movies being seen. Because I think, you know, everybody is so excited about how we're in a digital age and everybody can make a movie. All you need to have is a good story. That's not necessarily true. I always use the metaphor of a highway. A highway is great as a concept because, you know, you get rid of the street noise and everything. But imagine a highway that has so many cars in it that nobody can move. And that's the kind of thing that is now happening to the movies. You know, good movies, bad movies, it doesn't matter. They're burying one another, which is, again, very unfortunate for the more socially conscious movies, like the ones that not only your two most recent movies, but I've seen almost all of your movies, the ones you've made in the, in the past. And, you know, you're not getting necessarily more room for those movies. It's, it's more restrictions, which, which is very, very unfortunate. No, for sure. Um, I wanted to end just with a kind of playful question for the air, but I mean, how long do you think it is before we have something about impeachment uh, proceedings, some, some movie about proceedings? What's the pitch? <laughs> What's the elevator uh, pitch? <laughs> can I instead tell you a, a story? It's not going to take that long, but something that really uh, shook me up. You know, I'm, I'm in academia. And I was reading the Chronicle of uh, Higher Education uh, the other day, only a few days ago. And there was this story about, uh, do you guys know about Title VI? It's a federal grant allocated to teaching foreign languages and international studies across the uh, American universities. So there are these uh, uh, two universities, uh, Duke University and University of North Carolina, and they have this Middle East Studies program which is being uh, fed by the federal grants. And they apparently recently received a chastising letter from the Department of Education, led by the esteemed scholar of education, Betty DeVos, <laughs> <laughs> that is basically chastising them for not doing your job and threatening them to cut the funds. And the two examples they cite as not doing your job because obviously they have their language classes and they do conferences like the Arab Springs or the Israeli uh, Arab conflicts. But the two that the Department of Education apparently didn't like, one was Middle East film criticism. Can you imagine that? That's what really <laughs> shook me up. The other one, which sounds a little more esoteric, but I can defend it, not that I was a part of it. The other one was, other one was love and desire in the modern Iran. Pretty interesting subject, yeah, for yeah. a country in which you can't really have public display of emotion. Like, if you are a man and woman, you can't really hold hands or hug or kiss publicly. You go to jail. So in that sense, I think this is an issue that requires academic uh, seminars. So this is the kind of interferences we see now from the Trump government. So you're asking about impeachment yeah. tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I have, I have two quick answers. Yes. Um, you know, first of all, if you look at the Roy Cohen docs that are coming out and the Roger Stone docs, I think, you know, those movies are already starting to happen. So um, I think that we're seeing that. I'll just tell you my reaction to it as a, a creative person. A few years ago, I was in Alaska and I learned about a thing called a pizzly bear. Do you guys know what a pizzly bear is? So polar bears are losing sea ice, and so they've come onto land, and some of them have mated with grizzly bears, and so we now have a thing called a pizzly bear. Now, there are people you will talk to in the world who will say, oh, that's great, the polar bears are adapting. But to me, when you see those kinds of things, it means that you're in a really unhealthy environment, and that it's an environment and an ecosystem that's toxic and dying. And I think we need to start looking at whistleblowers as the result of a toxic environment where accountability and leadership have failed. And so that is where I think, you know, write a movie about a hero. 
Amen to that. Thank you all so much for a wonderful discussion. Thank you.